So we're talking here with Simon Rodriguez of the part, uh, Party of Socialism and Freedom in uh, Venezuela. The occasion for this interview was the visit of DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, to, um, to the bicentennial at, in Venezuela. On Wednesday, there was a uh, running gun battles in Caracas between what is reported to be just some criminal gangs and the police there. Can you talk about what's happening with that? Uh, this has been part of the decay and the, the decomposition of the, of the Venezuelan regime. One of its expressions is precisely this um, pros prosperity of, of gang the control of Venezuelan territory. There are big swaths of territory that are uh, under the control of criminal organized crime. Uh, for example, in the south of the country, most of the gold mining is done by uh, mafia, by, by armed organizations which exploit the mines um, and uh, come into deals with the military, with the government uh, for the um, for the commercialization of this gold that they are exploiting with very primitive methods, very destructive for, for nature. In the case of the cities, the, the problem of the gangs is related to several issues. Of course, the underlying situation, the, the basic foundation of this uh, social phenomenon is huge inequality in, in the distribution of wealth in Venezuela. Venezuela is a capitalist country, and you have very big um, marginal, what we call barrios, which are, uh, you know, the urban developments that are informal with precarious access to public services, um, where there is very high unemployment, uh, people are very poor, and so there are these, these underlying uh, uh, economic and social uh, conditions which have worsened hugely in the last, uh, at least the, the, the last uh, decade. But uh, besides that, which is like the, the breeding ground for this problem, we have the police corruption, which is a way for, for these gangs to get uh, ammunition, to get weapons, military corruption, uh, the fact that the jails are in control of these same organized crime groups. So the jails become, you know, centers for organizing this activity. Um, jails, of course, in, in, in appalling uh, conditions in Venezuela, where um, most jails are at 200 to 300 uh, percent of their capacity. They are overcrowded in, in horrible ways and with terrible sanitary condition. Um, besides that, there's the, the corruption in the judicial system. This amounts to uh, what, what we have is uh, really great impunity. Most crimes go unpunished. Um, in, in many places, many barrios, you know, the, the participating in this sort of activity is an economic way out where, where there are no other opportunities. And then uh, what the government did in, in face of the rise of the gangs was to negotiate with them, giving them control of the jails and of parts of the territory which they already controlled, giving them away like safe zones. They call them peace zones, meaning that the police would not go into these zones and the agreement would be that there would be no violent crime, no murders in these places. Of course, it didn't work out. It was a failure. And then the government went from the negotiating and, and establishing alliances with these gangs to the other extreme, which was to apply indiscriminate violence against the barrios, killing thousands of youth every year, uh, doing these massive operations. And what we are seeing in Caracas in the last two days is an ongoing uh, battle, really, that the city is paralyzed because of this battle between gangs and the police. Um, really, what it shows is, is the, the decay and the decomposition, as I have said, of Venezuelan capitalism. And really, it's totally incompatible with 
any notion of uh, socialism or, or, or a revolution in Venezuela, when you see this, this is the confirmation of a deeply rooted uh, problem of marginalization, uh, poverty, inequality, and uh, really getting into, into very extreme consequences as we have seen in the last few days. Some people would say that the social decomposition and the economic uh, disaster that Venezuela faces today is all caused by the U.S. sanctions. The history does not fit into that explanation because the first financial sanctions were in late 2017 and the first oil sanctions were in early 2019. What the sanctions have done is accelerate the economic crisis, but the Venezuelan economy had already shrunk about 50% before the, the sanctions. So uh, we, we are against the sanctions, obviously, but we cannot use it like a, a joker card that can be the explanation for everything. We asked Simone about the collapse of the economy and the oil industry in relation to government uh, corruption and incompetence. Well, you, you, we could give thousands of examples, but I'll give a few. Uh, the Venezuelan government acknowledged that by, by, by the speaker of the Central Bank of Venezuela, Edme Betancourt at the moment, that just in the year 2012, uh, this is before the, the crisis started as such, but it, it explains why the crisis started. Uh, the Venezuelan economy uh, had uh, suffered a huge uh, looting. It, it, th there were $20 billion, which is a lot of money for the Venezuelan economy, that were uh, assigned by the government for imports, and those imports were never made. Why did this happen? Well, because the government had a, a controlled exchange rate and the dollars, they, they were assigning them to, to whoever the government decided to, for whatever purposes it decided to do it. And uh, this includes, of course, the private sector. You, they would give uh, dollars for imports to the private sector and to the public sector. Uh, but since they were giving the dollars practically away, uh, the profit was made just at the moment that you received the dollars. But it was a huge profit. The, the, the margin between the official exchange rate and the parallel market exchange rate would be as big as a thousand to one. So uh, you, you didn't need to import and, and do the, the normal commercial circuit of, of getting profit that way because the profit was already made when you got the dollar. So what, what these bureaucrats and, and um, uh, businessmen, capitalists did was to fake the imports. However, the, this, this problem of having this huge margin of profit just from the exchange rate, uh, this continued for years. The government said, well, we lost $20 billion in 2012. But for many more years, they continued to use the same mechanism. They didn't correct the problem. Why? Well, because they were participating in the looting themselves. So the looting went on for years with the, the government perfectly aware that this was happening. And of course, aware because they were participating in the looting. Venezuela is also a graveyard of unfinished infrastructure projects, mega infrastructure projects like, like trains, uh, bridges, uh, things that were uh, contracted with Chinese companies, with the Brazilian Odebrecht company, which, by the way, when the Odebrecht scandal came out, Venezuela was the second uh, place where more bribes were paid, only second to Brazil itself. Um, so uh, you, you, you can, you know, be, be on the road and you're seeing these big pillars that were supposed to uh, have a train going on top of them, and there's nothing on top of them. They're, they're just the pillars, and they have been there for more than a decade. Uh, there are cases even when, when unfinished bridges 
uh, you know, the, the people who recycle, they start, you know, taking the, the iron away, stealing it to, to, to sell it because the misery is so, so big. Um, it, it's almost like a Garcia Marquez novel, you know, uh, what, what he called magic uh, realism. Uh, it, it seems literature, it's, it's, it's so insane. And well, the, this, is the, this is the situation. In, in the case of the electric crisis, Venezuela is an oil producing country that has to import gasoline because the refineries, because of the, the lack of investment, which you mentioned, uh, Venezuela is not, it used to export petrol, gasoline, you know, the, 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 these refined products from oil, and now it has to import them because of the disaster in the handling of the, of the oil industry. This was well warned before uh, the sanctions. The, the, the oil workers were warning, we're having environmental disasters, we're having oil leaks, we're having, uh, you know, a, a drop in the production rates, the, the refineries are in a horrible state. And what did the government do? It persecuted the workers, it, it jailed workers, it, it, it uh, detained them when they were in the assembly. Our comrades have been detained for participating in assemblies and handling out leaflets which denounce these this situations. Um, you know that that's the that's the thing. The, this uh, this crisis that started in 2013 started after the biggest oil boom Venezuela has experienced in its history. How can you, after having the biggest income you have ever had, then have the beginning of the worst crisis you have ever had? It can only be explained because of the economic policy of the Chavista government. Uh, you don't have a constant access to electricity. You don't have constant access to running water. Uh, it's uh, a, a complete disaster. Uh, there was this economic, this, this um, electric crisis in 2009, and the government decided to buy a lot of, um, a lot of plants for generating uh, energy, you know, through burning fuel, which is very polluting. But, well, it, at least it was supposed to be an emergency plan to, to be able to provide electricity when the hydrological uh, sources of, of energy had any problem. But what they did is they imported all of this junk, you know, second and third hand uh, uh, equipment. The people who did it were these, uh, you know, these young uh, capitalists linked to, to the to both the right-wing opposition and to the government. They were very well linked politically. They imported this junk. This junk is useless now. It's, it's not producing any electricity, but they have castles in Spain. They even, one of these guys, Alejandro Betancourt, he hired Rudolf Giuliani as his lawyer to represent him, to, to try to have the US drop some of the criminal charges that are being pursued against him. Um, he invited even Guaido's father to his castle, and, and they all met, and <clears throat> he in, invented this new enterprise for, for selling glasses in, in Europe. So that's where the, the Venezuelan wealth is. It's in, it's in the banks of Switzerland. It's in the banks of uh, places like Andorra, the Bahamas, Virgin Islands. That's where the wealth has gone. Obviously, not because of, of, a, of any socialist mechanism, because but because of the, the worst, the, the predatory capitalism Venezuela has known in its history. So this is the background to the bicentennial uh, that the DSA sent a delegation to. Can you talk about briefly about what was that bicentennial? The government had, you know, military parades. They were showing their jets and their tanks and the, you know, the military in close formation chanting hails to Maduro and, and to Chavismo. And in, in that context, they also held this international meeting called Bicentennial Congress of the People. And that's where DSA members, they went to Venezuela, they participated in this uh, Congress, they stayed at one of the best hotels in, in Caracas that cost $200 a night, which is about 100 monthly minimum wages. Uh, in, in, in Venezuela. Uh, they met Maduro himself. They went to also to a city called Barcelona. And uh, well, from what they have uh, 
posted, they were really excited and, and uh, ecstatic at the achievements of Venezuelan socialism. However, they were warned before their trip by uh, a group of Venezuelans called Venezuelan Workers Solidarity that they should try to meet dissident voices from the left, uh, both from Chavismo and from uh, Marxists and, and other sectors, uh, which they did not. They did not even reply to this letter. Um, we hope that uh, this incident, which is very unfortunate, you know, they, they being um, useful for the Maduro propaganda, which all of the Venezuelan state media showed this meeting as uh, proof that there is international support and that the U.S. left is very supportive of Maduro, and there's no indication that they went uh, any step further than what the government wanted to show them. Um, Certainly, they, they did not meet, uh, you know, the, the, the left activists and, and organizations that we know, none had any, any contact with them. I think that true solidarity has to be to, uh, you know, to, to support people who are struggling for the same things that you are struggling for. And therefore, uh, in Venezuela, abortion is completely illegal. DSA is for reproductive rights. DSA should be in solidarity with Venezuelan feminists who defend the right to abortion. Uh, DSA defends, you know, the, the rights of the LGBTQ community and is against discrimination. Well, they should side with Venezuelan activists from this community who face persecution from the government, a, a, a country where there is no right to uh, egalitarian marriage, there is no right to, to social security for partners of uh, uh, same-sex couples. Um, oh, oh, oh. DSA stands for a, for a $15 an hour wage. It should not be silent about Venezuelans having a one cent an hour wage. It's For me, it's a very logical, uh, easy to understand thing. Uh, that you should not side with the oppressors, the exploiters, and the capitalists, even if they claim to be anti-imperialist or socialist. Regarding trade union mm -hmm. rights, you don't you don't have the right to strike. It has been abolished by this memorandum 2792, which was adopted in 2019. Uh, it says that uh, the, well, it puts a bureaucratic process uh, as a as a requisite that makes it virtually impossible for you to have a legal strike. Some people here say that, okay, all of that may be true, but we here in the United States should just simply focus on ending the sanctions. There, there, there is no contradiction between being against sanctions and also supporting uh, political prisoners to be freed. Feminists who are in prison for, for uh, you know, aiding a, a rape victim to have uh, an abortion. These types of things are happening in Venezuela and the left should not be silent about it. Uh, there are more things that can be done because as uh, many people might not know, but the oil industry in Venezuela is not state-owned, but is uh, colonized by multinationals like the US-based Chevron. And Chevron is paying these uh, misery, semi-slavery wages in in Venezuela, the, the, the U.S. left could do a lot in pressuring Chevron uh, to stop paying uh, hunger wages to Venezuelan workers, and this would be of huge consequences in Venezuela. Um, there are so many things that could be done. Uh, of course, um, you have to uh, to take the perspective of the working class and, and not of uh, you know, this class collaborate, collaboration uh, concept of, well, we have to side with the government. So you can also be against US sanctions against Venezuela and uh, be openly vocal about the fact that it's an anti-worker regime, a bourgeois regime uh, that is based on the military, very reactionary, uh, that violates women's rights, LGBTQ rights, uh, indigenous people's rights, and so on. Given the fact that Maduro um, poses as a socialist, how has that affected the perception of or the support for socialism amongst workers in Venezuela? Obviously, the fact that um, this regime, which is 
rejected by 80 to 90 percent of the population and most of the working class um, labels itself as socialist creates uh, a, a bad perception of socialism as such not only because the government claims to to do so but also the opposition uses uh, this claim to socialism by the government the right-wing opposition to to make it a talking point that this proves that uh, socialism is a failure simone also commented that the bicentennial and the presence of dsa was not followed very closely by most workers in Venezuela, but they are aware of the spectacle of the international left coming to Venezuela in support of Maduro, staying in five-star hotels, and in general consuming resources that could be used for health care, for food, for education, and other benefits for Venezuelan workers, all the while, as I said, supporting Maduro. and. He commented about how the international left, therefore, um, is not uh, seen very well by many Venezuelan workers. In other words, would you agree that what this does is it actually weakens the cause of socialism and further confuses the working class, both in Venezuela and internationally? Undoubtedly, you have a picture of them praising Maduro, shaking hands with Maduro, or bumping fists, uh, and, and, you know, taking tours with these members of the Chavista bourgeoisie. Really, the, the, those images will speak. The criticism of Maduro, and even before him of Chavez, by Simón and his group, the Party for Socialism and Freedom in Venezuela, has been dismissed as coming from uh, Trotsky's. One of Trotsky's hallmark ideas was the idea that capitalism cannot develop society in the former colonial world, that what's required is to link up that development with socialism, genuine socialism, and a worker's democracy. We asked Simone about that. Well, I, I agree with Trotsky, obviously, but um, you don't have to be a Trotskyist to, you know, stand for basic dignity and, and uh, for workers' rights. And to oppose the Venezuelan government, you don't have to be a Trotskyist because around 90% of the Venezuelan people are against uh, the, the Maduro government, 85% according to some polls, 90% according to others. Uh, it's the clear majority of the working class who is against Maduro, and it would be very strange if this did not, did not happen when you have the, the really the misery wages that were around three dollars a month in 2017 before the sanctions. So it's also not because of the sanctions. And the, in people in Venezuela, you don't have to explain this too much. People know it. It's common sense. Uh, it's clear. People have experienced the hunger and the the push for forced migration since at least 2015. So it's well before the sanctions. You don't have to convince anyone that, that Maduro is not a victim. People, people know that Maduro is, is a victimizer. Um, but if you, if you have pre prejudices uh, against the uh, Trotskys or Marxists, well, uh, do, do your own research, look at, look at, look at reality. Um, I, I would cite some, what some people have said. The Communist Party in Venezuela, which is a very classical Stalinist party who has supported Chavismo since its beginning, and now it's in a somewhat critical situation. They, they don't break away clearly, but they, they do consider that Maduro has steered away from, uh, from Chavez. They think there is a break between Maduro and Chavez, and that Maduro in some way has betrayed uh, the Chavez politics. They, the, the Communist Party, said in January this year that the Maduro government was in a dangerous path sliding towards fascism. You have peasants who are uh, imprisoned for struggling for land, um, feminists who are not, uh, you know, Trotskyists, who are saying, well, uh, why is the government jailing feminists for, for defending the right to abortion? 
there are a lot of people who you can listen to if you don't want to listen to the to what the Trotskyists are saying. But everything that we are saying can be checked and should be checked. Credibility to to regain prestige in Venezuela, and I'm talking about the international left mostly. It it only can come with a firm position against the Venezuelan government. Of course, it, it, it should be in an anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist perspective, uh, denouncing the sanctions and denouncing the role of, of the US government in Venezuela. But if he, if he doesn't say clearly, we don't support the Maduro government, we think that the Venezuelan people deserve, uh, deserve better and deserve the, the opportunity to uh, really take their own destiny in their own hands and not be at the at the mercy of the military and of the you know intervention from Russian troops and Chinese uh, economic interests and even the the U.S. imperialist oil companies like Chevron and so on that are looting the country. Um, really, this is the only way forward to try to rebuild. Um, you know, the, the left and emancipatory perspective in Venezuela.